Welcome back to Definitely Not Definitive. I'm Ken. And I'm Bethany. And we're just a couple of wackadoos in love that love reacting to some Maxor. Yes, we do. And so we're checking out uh, Maxor's Bloodborne review this time. Uh, Bloodborne review, Defeat Gods, Dal wa Waifu sim Simulator. Um, so we've checked out Bloodborne before and uh, we've done like some trailers and some boss battles and lore and whatnot. Now it's, it'll be interesting to see uh, Maxor's take on it as it always is. As it always is. If you want all of our Maxor reactions, check out the description of this video. We got a playlist there for you. Are you ready? Yes. The video has spoilers. Bloodborne is a Lovecraftian horror RPG that no one understands by definition, <laughs> where the player is free to attack hordes of human children at will and consume oh. their innards. If that in-depth and engaging anti-baby gameplay appeals to you, <laughs> keep listening because it gets worse. In this game, you play as John Bloodborne, a foreigner incapable of speech without the use of sign language. And strictly yeah. comes to the ancient city of London, seeking treatment for the sins of his cousins. In doing so, he will begin hallucinating talking dolls spider people and the oh. right journeying further john bloodborne becomes conscripted into the service of a gay elder god and the 60 year old man he keeps as a pet and is given the ultimate task of killing an invisible infant in order to cure his anemia to accomplish oh that herculean task the player must journey through dark forests terrifying nightmares and the meth-ridden alleyways of a post-brexit britain slaying monsters <laughs> exploring and tricking women into being impregnated by god so you can consume the child this game is an excellent realization of of a metroidvania with something new around every corner a great action rpg which pits you against insurmountable odds and extreme challenges and has a gripping story and lore about discovering the eldritch truth so if you can play it yourself because i'm not going to hold back on the details it's no secret that my reviews are entertainment first so i don't suggest using me as genuine advice <laughs> However, most people can't play this game ever because you have to buy a $400 magical box sold by the wizard Sony in order to experience <laughs> it. And even then, you get to see it in an amazing 30 frames per second with no anti-aliasing. Port this game to PC, I beg of you. In fact, I can assume that a lot of people watching this video will basically never play the game. But keep watching because I'm hilarious and original. Do that, and I can give you the full, unfiltered, uncensored, unsubstantiated, and unsportsmanlike experience that is Bloodborne. is what makes this game great and the easiest way to describe it is simple but complicated on a simple level your baby brain is responsible for only two tasks dodging and hitting and dodging in this game renders you temporarily invincible sounds easy right wrong because every single enemy is adjusted to keep pace with you basic enemies are basically able to whoop your ass into fucking non-existence <laughs> every encounter therefore is tense and engaging when you kill someone it's because you were faster and had more meth than they did on a complicated <laughs> level you have a gun and normally bullets hurt people but in london bullets are a suggestion like the Geneva Convention. Here in England, it's all about the knife bins. Except when you shoot somebody mid-attack, you gain the mystical and arcane ability to plunge your fist through their ribcage like Mortal Kombat and oh. off their heart, which is considered rude and a slight annoyance. This extends to behind them if you charge an attack, which sometimes causes you to reach up a pig's asshole oh. without the prostate like fruit by the foot. Side note, the most optimal farming route for currency in this game is called Murgo's Pig Fisting Route. See, I changed the webpage. And in this route, you sneak up behind this guy and do him the dirty. Then entice these two Swindler bastards to be mauled to death by members of Organization 13. Repeat 50 times. On a complicated level, every single weapon in the game has two different modes with two different movesets. And transforming between them gives you special attacks in addition to running attacks, punching attacks, 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 On a theoretical physicist level, your character memorizes squiggly lines and fridge art created by gods for passive bonuses that work regardless of weaponry. My favorites are more money, more money, and more money they stack. <laughs> Finally, on a meta theoretical chiropractic level, every weapon is customizable with different different gem slots that give differing effects for your attacks. And there are different types that can literally change all of the stats of the weapon, like making a fucking spear do more damage based off of intelligence. There's definitely more and a lot of strategy in how you level up your character, but I assume that you know how to level up in a fucking video game. But with all this <laughs> combat prowess, you may be wondering, Maxor, who are these crusty abominations that you're fighting on screen? Well, to learn that much, we're going to have to delve into the lore. So buckle your britches, bitches, because this shit is wild. If I say something questionable, just accept it as fact 
I can be trusted. 60 years ago, 20 rowdy college students took their education extremely seriously because they found woman Cthulhu. She was just in a portable toilet downstairs. Also, because they were bored, they beat to death a god of the sea with some bats, but that's a story for later. It turns out the entire world is ruled and created by a race of elder gods beyond human comprehension called the Great Ones. Figuring this out, they got Cthulhu's blood and were like, we can make a religion out of this. Because it turns out the blood can heal people, which is really good due to all the knife crime. So everyone starts drinking it a little too much and they get the money to build 36 cathedrals. But it turns out eventually the blood turns you into a werewolf. So the church hires a guy named German to go fight the beasts with an organization known as the Hunters, but there's too many beasts, so he gives up. Now the knife crime has increased even more and German sort of goes insane and creates a life-size doll of one of his students who is an eight foot tall Amazonian. He also canonically has sex with it. The moon oh. god, for some reason, kind of takes notice of this and is like, all right, listen, I'm building a suicide squad. I will bring your waifu to laifu if you serve me for all time as my slave. German reasonably thinks that this is a great deal and is imprisoned in a dream. This is where you come in. See, the moon god assassinates baby gods for fun, but needs a hitman to go into the real world to do it since he's confined to the ninth sure. dimension. So in addition to fighting all manner of giant beasts and uncovering dark secrets, the true aim of this game is to commit infanticide. There's enough bullshit here to fill tax legislation. So comment your own poorly summarized Bloodborne lore below. And for the rest of us non-shills, we have ample time to explain more of what makes this game great. Yes, Prepare you to have die. Been I am talking about bosses before I talk about the levels. In most video games, bosses cap off areas, but in Bloodborne, areas are preambles to a dick flattening, and nothing will challenge your skill in quite the same way. Except for the goddamn Witches of Hemwick, who were placed into the game for disability access. You can probably tell that Bloodborne <laughs> is a hard game. We don't even know if a games journalist can beat it. But it's hard in a fair way that tests your skills and reaction time. Except for Lawrence, but I'll get back to Lawrence later. What sets this game's bosses apart is that the challenge makes it feel like you're a really small dude jabbing a toothpick into a building sized deer demon. So yeah, I would be impressed if he killed that. But not only that, unlike Dark Souls, every single boss reacts meaningfully to how you attack them. Large beasts can have their bones cracked and their tendons wound into a slinky. Bone boys can be knocked over and have their marrow shipped. And human enemies will wince and recoil when they see your height difference. As well, every boss punishes you for cowardice and actively discourages backpedaling with their forward momentum, causing every fight to be an elaborate dance with a thrilling back and forth. Unless you're fighting Rom, who is the really hungry caterpillar if he had a a legion of arachnid slaves oh. who threw their heads underground like ostriches. We no. don't talk about him. And while we're on the subject of bad Good. bosses, this motherfucker, let me tell you something. The humanoid bosses in this game are paradoxically the most dangerous. But Mikalash is a psychological hazard that will hurt you personally. This boss literally feels like cut content because the fight centers around chasing him and his direction depends on RNG, making him an actual speedrun killer. When you corner him, he uses one attack and then you chase him again where he gains the power to insta-kill you. God forbid you're hit by because that's 10 minutes gone. Here's a tip. Save up 10 poison knives and steal from your family if you must. Then wait until he jumps down this hole. Poison him repeatedly and watch him spaz the fuck out until death. You will thank me. <laughs> but as a result of everyone who isn't Miko shit, conquering a boss in this game is absolutely rewarding on a level that other games cannot match. It's only because the odds are stacked against you in ways that don't feel bullshit most of the time that conquering them is the main reason I play. And their fights are undoubtedly the best I've ever done in video games. But that isn't most of the time in the game. In fact, a lot of your time is spent exploring the areas, so let's get into that. Lesson one in area design. Where the fuck am I going? Exploration is the name of the game, except it's called Bloodborne. Only this time, you don't bring smallpox and kill 20 million people. We're looking at a solid 10 this time, because the main enemies in this game are British townspeople. It's how the developers made sure you didn't feel bad about killing them. The plague of beasts infecting London causes people's teeth to become beast-like, makes you aggressive at night, and slurs your speech. So it's up to you to stop them, as a hunter should. If you don't look up where to go next in this game, good fucking luck. People get lost all the time. Get used to it. This game doesn't do exploration like, oh, look, there's loot in this hallway. My dopamine's gonna go crazy. That's baby shit. This is daddy's exploration where you find a route back to a place you were in 10 hours ago. And I hope you weren't expecting a mini map or any map. Every single hallway is a rabbit hole of discovery oh, and your hand isn't held. Case in point, Cathedral Ward is a level but feels like a hub area because it connects to fucking everything. And where you start the game is in the middle of a loop-de-loop -loop involving torturous experimentation. Just look at the fucking map of this game. Everything overlaps. And yes, there is a level called Nightmare Lecture Hall, and no, it does not connect to the Altar of Despair, although you would think that. Fittingly, the Lecture Hall is the smallest area, and more fittingly, 90% of the combat is graduates throwing cum at you. The game also has two completely <laughs> secret areas that you would not find without the internet. I would tell you how to enter, but I don't want to do calculus. And what you get at the end? Upper Cathedral Ward is legitimately a horror area in a game loved for its combat, because it's filled with enemies who act out my greatest fears. Stealing 
currency permanently. It gives me fucking chills oh. every time I talk about it. Castle Kanehurst is proof that From Software hates us all, since the best area in the entire game requires you to go to the Field of Corn in Ohio and trek down Waldo. But it's worth it to invade the house of that parasitic queen dwelling in her demented castle so that she may feel the wrath of the proletariat. All we have to do is kill Prince Philip, who guards the way as an eternal lich. On top of this, there are numerous NPCs and NPC quest lines spread throughout the world, all with a series of interactions with each other depending on location and timing. For instance, you could direct Nuns, Prostitutes, off? and Prince Philip to a church run by a lonely black sludge, then perform enough blood transfusions to send the nun into a yandere rage. Or you could direct them to the nice woman who runs the clinic down the street who only wants to help and assist others. Then, take a strange path through the forest and into her clinic to discover that she has been experimenting on all of them in order to create the Blue Man group. And if you want, you can take the umbilical cord away from her schizophrenic ass and eat it. The sky's the oh limit. Oh my god! Lines. And you know what my favorite quest line is? The one where you descend into literal hell, complete with eternal punishment, insanity, and femboy fishing, the scariest of them all. I'm, of course, talking about the DLC, the only DLC for this game. And if you play through Bloodborne, you have to play through the DLC. I'm not giving you a fucking choice. <laughs> why you should play the best expansion ever made since Spore Galactic Adventures. Jung jungles. Come with me on this amazing journey to find the secrets of the Bloodborne, the old hunters. I want you to imagine hell. Now imagine hell written by H.P. Lovecraft. It will be filled with squids, immigrants, and air conditioning. This DLC has none of that except the squids. For you see, those college kids from the lore section of the video were built fucking different. They experimented on an entire village and possibly beat up a god of the sea so fucking bad that her consciousness in the ninth dimension died. We spent an entire game killing an infant and these guys somehow killed the milf god. But anyways, in the process of this, it cursed them and all of the hunters to be doomed to a hell upon death, where they will hunt in a bloodthirsty rage without rest for all eternity. Indistinguishable from a political subreddit. Case in point, this is Ludwig. He's the first boss of the DLC and has a reputation he's for silent. causing refunds. Not because he's bad, but because he's too good for you. The first phase is as difficult for me as realizing that Golden Corral is not actually a real corral. But like every <laughs> restaurant except Golden Corral, the rewards at the end are delicious because his second phase is even harder. Now, I'm not going to lie, this DLC has four bosses and three of the hardest bosses I have ever fought in any video game ever. So your ass will wow. be clenched the yeah. entire time and the fact that he's the third hardest is fucking concerning. Some people <laughs> tell me Maxor, your videos have gotten me through tough times because they made me laugh. But like this boss, you are the one who is truly overcoming these challenges. And I believe in your ability to beat both of them. King. Boss lightning round. The DLC has many such cases of amazing bosses, including Lady Maria, who is the basis for German's extremely creepy eight foot tall doll fetish, but we'll get back to that. And Orphan of Cause, who was born from the literal dead body of a god. If you enjoy oh. the sensation of being beaten to death with a sharpened placenta, this <laughs> is the fight for you. And as with everything that From Software makes, they threw in a boss that they didn't really finish and called it a day. I'm of course talking about the Lawrence, which is a very mundane name for a fire monster locked in hell. Take my <laughs> advice, don't fight Lawrence, you only lose a part of yourself. Since this boss fights you by dropping off his own legs and then violently vomiting and shitting lava everywhere. Oh. I always wanted my game about dynamic dodging and elaborate fencing to be reduced to shitty area denial like it's Team Fortress 2. To wrap things up, the music of this game is pretty good, but the DLC music is fucking insane. I don't know what it is about Japanese composers being able to make better symphonies than the continent that invented them, but just take a listen. Shit, I'm alive right now. Have you ever thought, as I do, that this game is just too good? That you would really rather be playing a shittier version of the game? Such as the engagement of the Chalice Dungeons. I, of course, jest. They're fine, probably, except for half of them, because Bloodborne has an optional system of infinite dungeon generation for all of those who wish to break free of the shackles of good level design. Let's <laughs> talk about how, and more importantly, why. First of all, Bloodborne has a system of dungeons that everyone shares and dungeons that are random. For my footage, I played the shared dungeons that you can be guaranteed the pain you witness on screen is mandatory. <laughs> One of the biggest strengths of Bloodborne is the ability to have interesting and challenging enemy encounters gently rubbed with the bloodstained hands of Miyazaki. But I don't think I have to explain to you how randomizing almost every encounter in the game could be imbalanced. But fortunately, most enemies you encounter in the Chalice dungeons are new to spare British people your wrath, so you instead fight SCP-96 
six foot wide here. <laughs> it turns out that the entire city of London was built on a Celtic burial ground, an ancient civilization called the Tumerians, who discovered the healing powers of blood and then mysteriously disappeared. Wow, I wonder what happened. This is all cool in theory, but the reality is that most of the time you fight the same four enemies, and the first three dungeons can be replaced by Simon Says. My cat literally wouldn't notice. The chalice dungeons are so forgotten that the developers use them to put joke enemies into the game. My favorite is the man who aggressively rolls at you, stark naked, wearing only yeah. his Nikes. The uniqueness also extends to the bosses, and they're actually pretty cool, like Tumerian Descendant, Watchdog, and the three overweight men. Do you remember that basic enemy from like two levels? He is the boss now. Rom, he is the boss again. The only thing stopping me from throwing myself into a wood chipper is the fact that Miklash isn't back. And if you're going to have replays, you probably want to make sure that they're actually good. In fact, the bosses are so fucking imbalanced that the watchdog fight is primarily comprised of instant kill attacks. I beat Sekiro backwards on a keyboard and this shit is too fucking much. Now normally that would be all, but the dungeons go deeper. What we've discussed so far is merely the surface and there is a much darker syndicate lying just below. These places you must never venture for they are the save edit dungeons, whereby through wizardry the community are able to conjure up deep dark chasms and share them with the rest of the world. Of these secrets there are only two that I shall reveal to you and the first is the cum dungeon. Yes, you heard that correctly and clearly. The cum dungeon is the name of the most optimal farming route ever conceived by the fucking cricket people who do this shit. Whereby the player enters the chasm of place name and watches as a high level boss yeets itself off a cliff. Murgo's pig fisting route can give you 10,000 echoes. This gives 83,000. And if you thought that that sorcery was bad, it gets much worse. You can insert anything from the game files by save editing a chalice dungeon. Anything. This includes cut and unfinished content from the game that the developers forgot to delete. Like this doggo who attacks you with invisible lightning. Overall, the chalice dungeons are bad. They're not actually very fun to play, and yet I love them. Everyone loves them because they it. allow us to further explore a long dead game with the help of a passionate community. Now before we sign off, I know what you're thinking. Max or what about the multiplayer that I would love to talk about with all the footage I have but it's dead if this oh. game releases on PC and it better then I will talk about the multiplayer extensively and finally this game and this video would not be complete if I didn't talk about the hunter's dream after all the combat the battles and the difficulty of this game it's nice to have a place to recharge purchase items upgrade weapons and watch as it violently burns to the ground this is where you'll find German slowly wasting away as his soul remains captive for eternity and his doll waifu that he sold his existence to be with she talks to you levels you up offers you advice and german says you're allowed to have sex with her when i fell down and felt defeated she was there to pick me up when i emoted at her randomly she pretended to be impressed <laughs> and she was there graciously standing in the background of this one shot that i took of myself she is our waifu now and the game is perfect and complete because she is in it now excuse me as i engage in the supplementary lore material Material. Should you get the game? Yes, absolutely. I am biased. In fact, you should physically enter Sony's headquarters and demand that it be ported to PC. I will be right there with you. Tasers will not stop me. I would like to thank the corrupt hackers and politicians funneling money into this channel directly from the taxpayer. If you would like to contribute your funds accrued through extensive federal government corruption, you can head to my Patreon to learn more. I would also like to thank the kind denizens of the Mythbuster Smut Discord who sent me half the memes in this video. And as always, Thank you for watching. Oh man, uh, so, you know, Maxor uh, is pretty good at video games and has played a lot of the tough video games, and so for him to say Bloodborne is the toughest one he's played is, uh, is saying something. Yeah, and we watched w one of those boss battles that looked yeah. crazy intense, and to find out that that was only the third most difficult, um, <laughs> I can't imagine what the second and first are like. Yeah. Uh, if I get it correctly, like you basically like some like the dungeons in there are like built by the community and like they have their own little like, uh, which I mean is pretty cool that they can, they have that kind of design. Like, and is that something that was intended for this game or was that just something that just like is like a, a hack that people have been, have been doing? Yeah. Um, so that's something I'm curious about. Great question. I don't think that I necessarily had questions after this so much as like, I, I think I learned a little bit more about Maxor today. Okay. Um, because he really talked about how much he enjoyed this game. And all I could think is like, but Maxor loves Genshin Impact. And they're just, 
they're so the polar opposite ends of the video gaming spectrum that I'm I'm kind of trying to rectify those two things in my brain right now. But I learned a little bit more about Maxor today. Well, I think Genshin Impact is one of the things that's like the outlier in what he likes I mean, because you've seen him do uh, Doom uh, uh, before and um, you know Elden Ring, and so he likes obviously the from software games. Um, and like this seems like you know he likes some more like intense. Uh, you know, some Metal Gear um, as well, and Devil May Cry. Um, it's like Genshin's kind of like the outlier out of, out of all of them. That's fair. That's fair. And this game is very dark. Yes. Which, I, I mean, I think I kind of knew on, on the lore context from some of the stuff that we've seen, but Maxor just has a way of being incredibly blunt about it all. So I think, like, mm -hmm. just hearing his blunt terms for, like, this whole game is about infanticide and, and like, you know, um, it just, I don't know, it kind of drove the point home a bit more. Yeah, it almost felt like this game, like, you know, a lot of times he'll exaggerate and go to the extreme on certain things, but it kind of felt like, I mean, just some, some of the stuff that we've seen, like that he wasn't really exaggerating too much with, <laughs> with Bloodborne. It really was this dark and, cr and crazy and, uh, you know, the lore that, that he was going into. Um, Felt like he took a, a deeper dive in the lore too. Like I haven't, I haven't seen him like usually uh, go into the lore um, with, with with other games, I and mean, he just kind of talks about more the gameplay design, and everything like that, and like uh, talks about the different story elements and mocks them, and makes fun of it. But the fact that like he went into the lore of this, I was impressed with. And I saw some give some props to Avadi as well. Yeah, definitely. I think like this actually made me a little bit more intrigued to play the game while also simultaneously a little bit less eager to dive into this world of blood and guts and gore and killing babies. It did not make me more eager to play the game, especially when he was talking about how like there's like no map and everything like that and you just like you can get lost so easily and everything. I'm just like, no, Ken no. does not like to get lost. I hate getting lost in in, in games and- uh, Anybody who was on our Alien Isolation live stream knows this. Yes, yes, this is very very <laughs> much true. Um, do, do not like that at all. I, 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 want, I want a map. I want to know where, where, where I'm going and you know be able to plan things out. And just like walking around and being like, oh fuck, we're in the same place we were <laughs> like 20 minutes ago. We just get a half an hour. Um, yeah, so don't like getting lost. <laughs> You'll tell us what you thought about this down below in the comments. And if you want more of our uh, Maxor reactions, check out the description of this video. We got playlists there for you, as well as a link to our Patreon, where you can get early ad free access to our videos. Yeah. Thanks so much for checking out our reaction for uh, Bloodborne Review by Maxor, but just keep in mind that our reaction is definitely not definitive.